or when you want to talk. So go ahead, Joey. Sorry about that. Okay, well, I'll start from scratch again. Michigan has two Secretary of State's forms. They're called the uh, State uh, 153 and 154. These two forms allow you to request the manufacturer's certificate or statement of origin as well as your driving record. It can also include your driver's license uh, application. Once you file that, it's, it's similar to a FOIA request. They have to send you certified copies of it. Uh, regarding the manufacturer's statement or certificate of origin, I, uh, I, I'm kind of uh, compelled uh, by reason of use to get three certified copies. Once you get that copy, the state of Michigan in each state should have some organization similar to it has a commercial lookup unit. The commercial lookup unit is, is the place or the situs where they record and register all the commercial motor vehicles. Once you obtain that certified copy, then you contact them via certified mail notary process that you are redacting your signatures on the registration and you are letting them know that your automobile's primary use is personal consumer goods. Everything that's in their registry, including real estate and so on, it's, it's, it's a commercial use. You must tell them and inform them in your redaction or cancellation that the automobile is personal consumer goods. And under the 1993 Anderson's UCC1 version, I, and I can send some emails and I can send you the, the, the traction of it, it tells you what the primary use uh, it's classification of goods. And if the primary use is personal consumer goods, they give an illustration in the annotated version that an automobile used from going from home to work and work back to home, washers, dryers, all this sort of stuff, is classified. Therefore, its primary use is personal. It's not commercial. Once that is done, they have to correct the record. However, now you're going to have to have a declaration of intent or some kind of a letter or bond sent attached to the Secretary of State that shows that you're operating in good faith, that you are not at any time using the automobile for commercial purposes. The commercial aspects are clarified on a bill of sale, a purchasing agreement or offer, and the actual receipt when you when you purchase the automobile. There are five different levels that clarify the actual primary use of the motor vehicle at the dealership. However, there is a six block that says other. If you were to go and purchase a new automobile or even a used automobile off a lot, you would check the box other and write in personal consumer goods, non-commercial. It has to be done so they're notified. Once you leave the dealership in that situation, you would leave with a bill of sale, with a purchasing offer, and the receipt. Those three pieces of evidence are a guarantee that you're going to be exercising your liberty on the common way until such time as you put an instrument on the back of the vehicle that identifies your personal consumer goods. Now, the Secretary of State has authority, if you request it, to issue a non-commercial plate. She also has to be informed by your notice of intent to place into L-E-I-N-C-L-E-M-I-S, which is CLEMIS or NCIC or any of the computer matching programs that are operated worldwide, that this individual is exercising their liberty on a common way in a personal consumer goods that's non-commercial in nature. If you stop them, you are to let them go immediately. If they do not 
have any a situation where they've actually injured a warm body person or whatever. It's simply an aid and assist. Once they pull you over and they pull up this information from LEIN that's placed into the record by the Secretary of State, they will let you go. However, you can let them know also if you don't have one of their plates on, non-commercial plates on your automobile, you can tell them you're creating a plate and this is the number and it's a private conveyance, non-commercial. They have to put that into the record and let the law enforcement officials know that the occupant exercising or operating that, that conveyance is not engaged in a commercial activity, effectively connected with a corporation known as the state of Michigan or whatever other state of. The issue has to be predestined so that these individuals in law enforcement have a clarification on where they can enforce statutes. Now, in Michigan, the Motor Vehicle Code is clarified at MCL 257.204, MCL 257.202. Those two statutes clarify that the Secretary of State is the Chief Enforcement Officer. She is not allowed to delegate that authority to any inferior municipal courts. She is the chief enforcement officer. So she has to be directed through her records, through a notice of intent, that you're going to be exercising your liberty on a common way. You can bring in the Bill of Rights if necessary. You can bring in Article 9 of the Bill of Rights and Article 10. Article 9 says that those within government are we prohibited from disparaging us in the exercise of our vested birthrights. One of our vested birthrights is to exercise our liberty on the common ways. Before there were regular roads in this country, there were postal roads. And the post office and the Department of Transportation were responsible for those postal roads for delivery. The issue before us when you bring the notice of intent is that the Department of Transportation has an easement on the lands. In the notice of intent, the Secretary of State should be made aware of the fact that the Secretary of State and the State of Michigan are not owners of the land that the highways are built on that the Department of Transportation has the priority claim and exercise of enforcement powers on those highways. Once she's notified of this, you must give her the notice of intent that has to be put into the, the LEIN and quite possibly sent to the state police and every sheriff's department and every municipality police department in that they're all private commercial enterprises letting them know that the Department of Transportation has the priority claim for enforcement of any statutes. The state statutes for motor vehicle codes and so on and so forth are territorially and legislatively restricted. So the Department of Transportation via the post office has entered into easement agreements with the individuals that actually own the land. Going into a deeper consequence of, 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 the, of the seeding of lands, one would have to do the research, which I have, under MCL 3.191, 3.192, 3.202, and 3.2, all the way through to 224. This has to do with the seeding of the land. When Michigan was a territory, there were lands that were ceded to the, the territorial government. There were also lands once after Michigan became a state in 1837 that the federal government ceded to the, the corporation or the state known as the state of Michigan. However, over 85 to 90 percent of the state of Michigan and the Northwest Territories were subject to 
issuance of United States land patents. If those land patents were in place, there is an objective of jurisdiction that most courts do not understand full, full well until it's brought up properly. That's territorial and legislative. And the state government itself had no authority to issue any instruction or statutes governing the use of the highways that they didn't own. The highways themselves are under a lease agreement via patentees. They have entered into agreements as early as 1806 in the city of Detroit. That specific land patent issue was governed by the Governor and Judge's Journal. 1806 is when they passed it. It was under debate for two years. 10,000 acres in the city of Detroit, the, the actual de jure city called Detroit, were under United States land patents, and they were not subject to state control nor federal control. They were all individually owned and operated. The same thing goes with the highways and the municipality streets and so forth in all your, your local cities. Therefore, it's imperative that you inform the Secretary of State or request that they send you a certified copy of all the lands that were lawfully ceded by the federal government to the state of Michigan. They also have a letter of request that was issued by the governor requesting the federal government, while Michigan was both a territory and a state, to cede certain lands to it for specific use. Again, everything's a use. It's an excise tax on a benefit. The governor had to issue a letter, had the secretary of, or the, the, the attorney general draft it up for him, had to send it to the President of the United States in which he either granted or denied the ceding of the land to the state of Michigan. That letter had to be sent in return to the Secretary of State's office, to the Governor, to the, the, the State Attorney General's office, and had to be recorded in the Secretary of State's office. If the letter, if the granting or the ceding of the land was granted, the actual property description, the land description, had to be recorded. And once it was recorded, depending on which county the land was situated in, a recording of it had to be made in that county too. It was also recorded in the Bureau of Land Management Eastern Division. It was also recorded in the archives, National Archives in Washington, D.C., Everything that was done had to be done because it's a form of treaty. And it granted the state's legislative and territorial jurisdiction over the land, subject to the easements that were recorded by the Department of Transportation and the United States Post Office. Once this is done, we should be having, have the ability to request upon the, us establishing that the primary use of the automobile is personal consumer goods. It's not using the commercial activity that's effectively connected to the corporate state of Michigan, corporate United States, nor any of their political subdivisions. Political subdivisions could mean any number of things, including but not limited to receiving funding, any kind of a money, monies of whatever nature, or some kind of a backup system. If that's done, then they're, they're a part of the corporations, they're part of the corporate structure. But once that is done, then the Secretary of State has the right to, as a chief enforcement officer, there's another term that's used. It's called titular head. That's T as in Tom, I, T as in Tom, U-L-A-R. She has two hats she wears here in Michigan. She is de jour. She's an ex, like, like a secretary of state conducting commerce or discourse between countries. And then she is the chief enforcement officer or administrator over the various statutes, one of them majorly being the Motor Vehicle Code. She also has authority under, under MCL 205, MCL 206, and MCL 211, and a number of other areas. 
because of the seeding of the land. So at any rate, a request can be made with a notice of intent, and we're discussing issues amongst ourselves in the group that Lee and I are putting together that we may use the issue of accessing the trust accounts, both the Social Security and the CSDQV trust, and issuing bonds, once we take control of them, issuing bonds to the, the state of Michigan that is a guarantee that we're not exercising any benefit or privilege for use of the highways and use of our personal consumer goods, which belong to us. Once the manufacturer's statement of origin is recaptured, that goes to us. We have the higher title. And we have, we have a recourse to do a quieting title on the automobile. So having said that, questions. So, so let's talk about the instrument that you put on the back of the car. We at the National Standards Enforcement Agency, we wish to go ahead and uh, actually the grand jurors of the American people, we have, uh, we'd like to do a, do a tag to put on the back of the car to identify each one of the grand jurors of the American people. To interjecting, one could reasonably use Article 10 of the Articles of Confederation that says we have a right to ingress and regress to and from anywhere in the country without licensure. However, you'd want to understand that the, 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 the aspect of the nature of a license plate is that it's commercial in nature. If it says non-commercial private consumer goods or private conveyance, that should suffice and have a number. If one has, for example, filed a UCC1 financing statement with accompanying security agreement and so forth, one can use the file number of that UCC filing number on the UCC1 and use it as a number to identify his personal consumer goods. That's just a suggestion. But it's an identifying number and it's exclusive to you Either you are the debtor or the creditor on that UCC-1. It belongs to you. So you really have to do the UCC-1? You could. That's I, I, just an example. You don't necessarily need that. You can actually make up a plate and say personal consumer goods, non-commercial automobile. You don't use motor vehicle. Mm -hmm. You can use your imagination. If you wanted that recorded with some specific organization like the Citizens Grand Jury, which is actually the Committee of the States of the Articles of Confederation, 25 and Airmen. I've known about this since about 1981. Tell me, say that one more time. I said the Committee of the States is under the Articles of Confederation. It's a 25-man common law grand jury. It's never been done away with. These people in California have simply they've resurrected what's already been in place and, and acknowledged to us. But because of the nature of their court system being commercial, they don't want us to bring in law. Natural law has to come in. They don't want it. And so you're exercising your liberty on a common way. California has a group, I think it's called the King's Bench, John Quaid is the chairperson of it. John Quaid is an actor. He's got an IQ of around 220. He said that he had to finally ask the court about 14 times. He finally got it right. He said the term to use was exercising your liberty on the common ways. And he got the right answer. I've got some information that I got uh, transferred from audio tapes, the old uh, audio tapes, onto a DVD, where he discusses this with a former judge, a retired judge, who used to teach at the, the judges' school in Reno, Nevada. All judges have to attend the school. So it's up to you, and I can use an Old Testament reference. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the tribe of Manasseh stayed on the Egyptian side of the, the river, okay? And the others went on the other side. 
each one of those families or clans created a boundary marker that was unique to their clan. We sometimes reference it to arcane history. It's called a family crest that identifies your property. Now go to Texas or Wyoming or any of these places where they raise horses and cattle and sheep and all this sort of stuff. Didn't they brand their own livestock to identify mm -hmm. their property? Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing, isn't it? That's correct. So use your imagination. And if you're lucky enough to dig up your, your family crest, then use it. The reason why we're being pulled over is we've been induced, fraudulently induced into believing that we had to register our property. Because of that fraud, we can go back after the state for hundreds of billions of dollars in damages because we don't have to. And they didn't tell us because of their own codes. The Uniform Commercial Code clarified it, in, and this is in 1993, and I, and I, and I got the, the entire Anderson set from 1993 that was amended to 1996, and it clarifies under 9-109, colon 13, that it's the primary use of the property, and then it put a description of what personal consumer goods were. Now, this... Ronald Anderson is an, was an attorney down in Texas. Well, then you'll agree. Good things happen in Texas, right? <laughs> That's right. So I'm saying the gentleman did the research. I don't find any defects in the research. It's just that when they tried to change things radically because the Bar Association tried to take care of us finding the legal loopholes into their, their fraud, which is intrinsic, extrinsic, and constructive, you name it, every kind of fraud you can think of, they're trying to put a veil over our eyes or conceal the truth of the matter. So when they revamped the Uniform Commercial Code in 2000 and 2001, they changed everything. You have to look far and far, far and wide to find the classification of goods in the Uniform Commercial Code. It's found in Article 9 still, but it's not at 109. And then there's a, a reference to it in Article 3. So apparently your registration for the automobile is a form of a commercial instrument, isn't it? Correct. And they're buying and selling those on the market. They're pooling them just like they are mortgages and everything else. They're pooling and servicing agreements. Once you redact that, now they've got fraudulent securities that are being sold, don't they? But until you tell the people that allegedly think that they own you, you and your property, that it's not theirs. Redact your signature. The first step is to get that manufacturer's statement of origin. I, I, would, I would recommend getting three certified copies of it. And then redacting your signature. And have it sent via a notary. Request an acknowledgement of that, re of that request when you redact it. If there's an acknowledgement, then you want to send, within a week of that, send the notice of intent to the Secretary of State along with a top of the acknowledgement. Do you, have these, do you have these forms already made? No, I'm in the process of doing that. I've got a lot of, a lot of, a lot of stuff on my platter, so to speak. But those two forms for Michigan alone, and each state should have the same forms. You have to start by gathering the data. The data is the evidence. The evidence is that they've got a registration, and by, by being registered in the commercial lookup unit, it denotes the original intent or use or primary use of the property. You have to correct that first. I will be sending copies out. There's some other fellow members in, in, in the group that Lee, Lee and I are part of. We're working our, our hineys off on this stuff. We don't want to leave a sour taste in the, in, in, the, in the mouth of those who are working within corporate government. We want to make them friends. We don't want to make them enemies. But when they finally understand that we know what we're talking about, they will work with us. And so every cop that comes by and, and pulls us over, he's going to say, well, well be on your way. Have a, have a good day. I'm sorry I, so, I'm sorry I pulled you over. He's already going to have access to all that information via the, the computer system. They're in, they're in my computer system. 
and the Secretary of State will be using her chief enforcement powers over the Motor Vehicle Code and these other areas. And they have to adhere to what she says. Make sense? It makes absolute all the sense in the world. I never knew that she was the chief enforcement power. Yeah. MCL 257.202, MCL 257.204. Let me, let me interrupt for just a second, Joey. Let's, she's the chief enforcement officer of the Motor Vehicle Code. Right. Just make that clear. Oh, right. What, okay. what, what she is the chief enforcement officer of. She's and, not the chief enforcement officer of the whole state. She's just the chief enforcement officer of the Motor Vehicle Code. She has mm. chief enforcement powers over MCL 205, 206, and 211, too. 211 is the ad valorem tax, property tax. Because of the seeding of lands, the state of Michigan cannot tax land that's not been seeded to it. Christy, is this call being recorded? Yeah, this is very important information. I believe our freedom to travel is, is the whole basis of the pyramid of our freedom, if you want to call it that. So this is terrific. Right, that's just, what, what people will have to do is, is whatever Joey is quoting as far as the MCL, which is Michigan Compiled Laws, they'll basically have to look at the noun version of the name of that MCL and then find the corresponding uh, law that's in your state just using the noun name. Every state's the same. It's just, you know, it's got different nomenclature. So I just wanted to make sure it was recorded because Joey has a tendency to uh, quote things and people are not able to write them down as fast as he's talking. So if it's being recorded, that's a good thing. So that way everybody can come back and listen to what Joey has to say as far as what he's quoting. Yes. And I apologize, Christy. I, I've been at this for over 40 years. And uh, yep. uh, in the learning process, it's difficult for me to slow down and say, whoa. So I need either a pretty woman, a dry board, or a PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> hey, Joey, uh, Joey, I'll tell you, Christy is a pretty woman. The name of the organization is Independent Education Association. And education is knowledge that sets us free. And if we have errant knowledge, we have to find out there may be something to contradict that. It's, an, a, it's a constant quest for, for truth. We're searching for truth. And truth yes, sets us free. John 5 and 32. Mm -hmm. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And isn't that what we want, Christy? We want to be free. Absolutely. Great information. We just have to absorb it. And uh, follow through, Christy, and and we already have our numbers. We know what to put on the plates, just a tag. But that won't work on unless you have your car out of the system, will it? That's the first thing to do is to get that. I, I, again, I'm suggesting three certified copies of the manufacturer's statement or certificate of origin, and then redact it. And then, then you send your notice of intent with it, which should be very brief. And uh, some of the other guys in our group are, are suggesting that maybe we could bond it. But that means getting in possession of the Siesta QV Trust and the, the uh, Social Security Trust and so forth. You have to have mm -hmm. something to fund your bond. Well, we have but, some in our group that are doing bonds on... Uh, Instead of insurance, they're doing bonds, and this and, and they're being take, they're being accepted by the state. Okay, well, there's there's one other one other form that the Amish and the Quakers use, and it's called assurance. And what they do is they they fund money certain a certain amount of, 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 of per person or per organization per month into a fund. So if a calamity hits, say, say with the Amish, a barn burns down or whatever, it's all covered. But it's not insurance because the term insurance means interstate commerce. Oh. The insurance is a no-no. The bonds are not insurance. The bonds are an actual underwriting instrument. You don't want at the end, and you gave a bond, so they, I'm, I'm underwriting all this stuff with a bond. Go ahead, Christy. 
I do have a friend. He is retired from the military. He does know how to do that, and he actually had it all put together. And he called the the, the guy that takes care of the insurance statewide. What was it? He called that office anyway, and he told him to. Yeah, something like that. I wish that's not exactly what he called it, but anyway, he called them and told them what he was doing, and the guy said, "Well, why are you calling me? You don't need us." He said, "You're doing just exactly what insurance companies do." He said, "The insurance oh. companies to insure you actually access the SESQ trust." They are actually the underwriters. They're the last one on the line. AIG is owned by Henry Kissinger. AIG is the chief underwriter in the United States. But remembering one thing, and maybe this is another point is, that's our point from where we're going, but <clears throat> when Congress writes a bill, they can only address one subject matter in the bill. They have to have a, a, a message of, of a mission statement for the bill, what its purpose is intended for, then they can only put one subject matter on the bill. And what Congress has been doing since 1871 has been doing pork belly. They've been adding other issues and subject matter to the bills. It's unconstitutional. It's actually non-constitutional. So everything that Congress has passed since 1871 has been non-constitutional. That throws us completely out of the water. I, yeah. I don't know how Congress, anything they've done since 1859 is constitutional because they haven't been lawfully convened. Well, that's right. And, and, they, and they're and they operating as a corporation anyway. Right. Here's right. an issue that maybe most people are not aware. Everyone's worried about Congress, the federal Congress, passing this law and that law. Well, that Congress cannot enforce those statutes on unceded land. Well, the citizenry are irrelevant unless you claim to be a U period, S period citizen. However, the original uh, Constitution said that the states had state citizenship. It was not. It was never intended to be federal or national. I look at the people as the people, and the way that laws apply or don't apply, and then I look at the citizens. The U.S. Citizens 14th Amendment says anyone that's a registered voter, predominantly, are subject to any laws that Congress has done because they're subject to the United States and Congress is an instrumentality of the United States Corporation. So that yeah. is the leverage that we have on them, that the people are not subject to those codes, rules, right. regulations, ordinances. Uh, one is a, a unanimous declaration of vested birth rights and liberties, and these are the ones that are guaranteed under Article 9, 9th of the, the Bill of Rights. The original Bill of Rights is all we, 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 we cling to. The 14th Amendment doesn't apply. In fact, the 14th Amendment uh, right. restricts the, 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 the corporate government. The other document... I, I, understand, I understand that. The 14th Amendment applies to the citizens. They're 14th Amendment citizens. No, they're second The Bill of Rights are for the people. Yeah. But but the second document is the Declaration of Title by Hereditary Succession, and they have to show you by authenticated material evidence how they have a higher title, exclusive title to your body, physical body, than that which you possess. It's about 14 pages. And I guarantee oh. I cover just about every base you can think of. I would like to go ahead and get it out there if that's, that's necessary. But it, it gives people a different thought form. Who really owns you? Who do you belong to? Who's got the higher title to you? They keep saying these birth certificates and all that. It's all fraud by non-disclosure, isn't it? Fraud vitiates every con contract, doesn't it? So I'm saying a lot, a lot of it, it, it's, it's good if we can take control of these trusts, but if they want to bring that, that issue into the court, and it's already been brought into court in California by a woman who was homeschooling, and a state senator from California asked her a question. She said, do you have a marriage license? Yes. Do you have a birth certificate? Yes. Then we own you. I got a copy of the transcript around here somewhere. I could not believe that. Well, immediately I would have said, well, in that case, then, then uh, the relevancy of this event is that you perpetrated a fraud against me and my mother. 
No, she didn't say that. But I, if I would have been her, here's, here's a mother that wants to homeschool her children. And, and it's state senator asked her two simple questions. Do you have a marriage license and do you have a birth certificate? And that gal took her right back to 1921, which is the Shepherd Townsend Child Paternity Act, which created a birth certificate. She should have filed a suit against the state of California, the corporation, for making a materially false claim. See, fraud was perpetrated upon her mother. So you've got to sign this birth certificate. And I know, I know hundreds of people in a homeschooling group I used to be a belong to. Their, their children don't have birth certificates. They were birds at home. They had midwives. Yeah, most, that, that's what most of my, all of mine were born at home. My only first few have birth certificates, and then I learned, and the others don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think in closing, you've got to do things in the steps of process. Steps of process are to get a, obtain the driving record and the application for the driver's license, as well as the manufacturer's statement of origin, certified copies of all of it. Once you get that, then you do the cancellation or redaction on the, the manufacturer's certificate of origin, or statement of origin, and then attach a copy of a notice of intent. And if they will not issue a, a separate non-commercial private, private conveyance plate, then you tell them what you're going to put on a plate and put it on. And then they have to notify by by inputting the, 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 the documentation into the LEIN and NCIC and all these other computer matching programs that if this individual is stopped, he's not engaged in a commercial activity, you are to let him go or her go. Hey, Joey? Yeah. If you have a, a used car, uh, how do you obtain the MCO on that? Depends on what state actually uh, manufactured it. Now, Lee would probably have a good understanding because he, he used to work in the automotive industry. But each state that manufactures a car, the car, when it comes off the, the assembly line, they are the ones that issue the manufacturer certificate of origin. And if you have a used one, you first contact the commercial lookup unit in Michigan. They will have a record that shows where the original manufacturer statement of origin is located then you would have to go to that state to obtain certified copies of that. I see. Okay. And then you'd have to record it that you are the owner, in fact, of this personal consumer goods. It's not a motor vehicle. Motor vehicle is a term of limitation. Personal consumer goods are automobile or not, or conveyance. But the state that actually, you know, rolled out the automobile from the assembly line is the one that would have the manufacturer certificate of origin. They file those forever? They're filed. Now, they used to uh, microfish them and then destroy the originals. Now they've changed their operation in Michigan, and some of them are trying to say that the manufacturer statement of origin doesn't exist. You won't know until you do either a FOIA request or do the form request on the Form 153 and 154. You might have to attach an addendum to clarify this is the VIN number, blah, blah, blah. This is the model, the make, all that sort of stuff. So they would yeah, not I have can, any. Uh, if I can interject here, if you look at the VIN number, and you can Google how to uh, decipher a VIN number, and the VIN number will tell you where the car was manufactured. And most often, you're talking about a used car, but you know, a lot of times, let's say a used car, they might have, you know, when you buy a brand new car, they've got that big sticker on the window, and it tells you all the options that are on the car, and it tells you how much they cost, and all that kind of stuff. Well, that'll right. tell you exactly where the car was manufactured. There's also a lot of times if you open the left front door, the driver's side door, uh, there's typically manufacturers today put a sticker on the uh, door to let you know where it was manufactured. But the VIN number really is the key. And one thing that everybody needs to understand as far as vehicle manufacturing is that when a car rolls off the assembly line, it's already predicated as to what dealership it's going to. 
It doesn't matter if it's being manufactured in Japan or Germany or wherever. It's already predicated as to which dealership that car is going to go to. That's how they track inventory. And that's how they, they keep up with everything because how could you keep how could you track inventory at a dealership if you didn't know where the car was going to go when it left the plant? So that's the key for automobile manufacturers is obviously inventory. They want to keep their inventories in line with consumer demand. And also, whenever you are tracking inventory, you're obviously keeping track of the origin of where the car was manufactured. It could be a BMW, it could be a Rolls Royce, it could be a Chevrolet, it could be anything. But as soon as that car rolls off the line, it, they already know where that car is going as far as the dealership is concerned. So if you did the Google on the VIN number, you could save yourself some footwork. Uh, uh, if the Secretary of State's office in a uh, commercial lookup unit in Michigan or whatever state was didn't have it, you could you could eliminate that process and just go right directly to the Secretary of State's office in the state that has the uh, manufacturer's certificate of origin. Yeah, so when you buy a new car or a vehicle or personal property, all you do is just tell them you want the MCO, right? Right. Okay. And, you, and here's, here's a concept that goes along with that. Everything has to be done in threes. You have a purchase offer, you have a bill of sale, and you have a receipt. If you have all three of those documents in your, your possession, there is no jurisdiction for law enforcement to pull you over. Okay. You, you become what they refer to as the owner in fact. What Go are ahead. those three again, please? Is the is, is the purchase offer, the bill of sale, and the receipt? Okay. What is the purchase offer? The purchase offer is what they they you you can actually go into a dealership and you can actually you know negotiate the price down, or you can get added features. Blah 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 blah. You negotiate, but uh, but that's a written purchase offer. Yeah, the purchase offer is what you actually pay for the vehicle. A lot of times people don't pay what's on the sticker. Okay. And then the second one? The second one is the actual bill of sale. There you go. That comes as a result of the first one. Right. Correct? And then now you've got a receipt for a tendered offer. Okay. And then the third one? The third one is the receipt itself. That's, that's, you, you tendered them an offer, didn't you? Oh, Okay. There has to be a receipt for something that was tendered, an offer, and something that might be one to consider in the future is, is to uh, issue an indemnity bond to the Secretary of State's office that indemnifies against any damages that may be incurred by the automobile. I Here's think we should. Bond. I mean, why not? Why not? Yeah. We, I mean, we, we have our uh, SSK trust account, so why not? Let's, we, we're doing it. We're doing it yeah. and sending it in. This being accepted for insurance. Yeah. But so, anyway, yeah, all we all we have to do is draw it up. Looks like to me. Well, just for a point of information, the state of Michigan in Michigan is liable for every accident that happens on its highways. That's why they commanded us for for forced insurance. Before 1949, there was no such thing. You've got to do a lot of research, but I'll tell you what, you'll see the scam that's been gradualism, and they used insurance because it's interstate commerce, but it's, it removed all the liability of the state of Michigan, the corporation, who were compelling us into getting driver's licenses, into registering our automobiles and giving them the, the, the vested security interest, primary vested security interest in the automobile. And then they changed the nature of the automobile into a motor vehicle. Title 18, Section 31. They're sneaky, and it's all because of the Bar Association. You're kidding. You, the Bar doesn't have anything to do with this, do they? Well, they're <laughs> the ones writing the statutes, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And so the Bar Association, are they're, they're, they're doing everything beneficial for the Queen, the Vatican, and all that sort of stuff so they can make money. It's all a revenue enhancement scheme. It has nothing to do with us having a possibility of injuring someone else with a vehicle, blah, 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 has, no, has nothing to do with it. It's all to make money. 
and they've already got more money than they can do than they know what to do with. They couldn't spend it in ten thousand lifetimes. They estimate the United States corporation has seven hundred and twenty eight trillion dollars in offshore bank accounts and trusts. Now what can you do with that many trillions of dollars? I can't even count the zeros. But it you know it's if people don't want to be uh, have a wake up call and receive it, that that's their choice. Uh, the only thing that Lee and I can do, and, and Christy, any of you can do, is, is you can let people know. It's up to them to do something with what they find out about. They have that's to make right. a choice. Lee and I made some choices. We're going to do something positive. I think once yeah. we start exercising our our rights, that the people will begin to uh, see what it's like to live free, and then uh, they'll, they may want to do the same thing. Yeah. It's, it's life by example. It's law by example. I guarantee there's not one of us on this call that would want to intentionally injure somebody. You're supposed to follow peace with all men. I, I, I have no idea, but they're, they're putting all these statutes, which are male prohibit us. They prohibit us from doing what? Well, because we act in a way that condescends that we're, we're following their statutes, we've given, given implied consent for the courts to have jurisdiction over our physical bodies. And life's too short for that. Most people don't want to be free because they're afraid. They're afraid yeah. of the government. They're afraid that they're going to go to jail. They're afraid that they're going to lose what they already have. I mean, I, we, we are, it's such a fear-motivated society today that it absolutely I, I, I makes me puke just to see and to, and to hear what people say. Kind of coin this phrase. Understanding that the Creator runs everything. So faith is the absence of fear. Fear is the absence of faith. Which do you have? Exactly right. It's a paradigm shift. People have to move to faith. There's nothing that we cannot do. So, Joey, are you going to, when you have some of these forms done up, will you send them out to me so I can pass them on to my group? Sure, sure can. Uh, I'll, I'll, the form 153, 154, that's for Michigan only. For all other groups that want to get involved in this, they, they have similar documents that are online with their Secretary of State's office. They have an actual well, unit within the Secretary of State's office that handles the commercial registry of it. Remember, the Secretary of State's office is the keeper of the record. They also have to publish all the manuals, the statutes, and all this sort of stuff. She's got one big bad job, and regrettably, she's got a bunch of crooked attorneys that are telling people to do things that they they don't have or don't have a right to tell them to do. I'll send those forms out, Christy. Hey, it's been okay. great. Happy pool. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking time to share this because this is just this is just what we need with what we're doing with you know the grand jurors and getting you know people into the American national. Instead of being, you know, U.S. citizens, that's that's the whole thing. People don't realize that. So the the form 153 and 154 for Michigan. If we had that to look at, then we would know what we were looking for in the other states. Then, right? Yep. Yeah. Those those should be a type shadow of the, the forms that each Secretary of State's office should have. Good. Okay. They all have, okay. They all have uniform codes, and you just, you just have to find the one that mirrors that specific code. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same, and that's the same in other forms that we've had to deal with, also. Okay. Yeah. Well, that is terrific. That is that is really exciting. Most people have no understanding of what it is to really be free. You know, they. They think being able to have a fishing license and a hunting license and a driver's license and and uh, going and doing what they they please to do as long as they have these licenses is uh, being free. Well, isn't it because of public schools? Yeah. In seven, the the legislators in the in, in the newly formed state of Michigan were already putting things together for public schools, public school system. In history was always being repeated, but if you're not inclined to learn history, uh, you're going to remain uh, SOS, I call, stuck on stupid, but some of us saw the SOS on the other side, stuck on smart. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Articles of Confederation is well worth reviewing in detail 
specifically Article 10 of, uh, or Section 10 of the Articles of Confederation, which covers the right of ingress and egress and ingress to and from anywhere in the country. That was brought in inherently because they knew the nature of our right to travel freely as men and women without hindrance. You know, we're not traveling toll roads. It was a natural inherent right. So separate civil rights from natural rights. Natural rights are the nature of the creator that he breathed into each and every one of us. Those are the inalienable. Those are the inalienable rights. Yeah. But you can't, and until you define them, which I did, I defined 109 of them. I got 38 or 40 some on more to probably add to it. It, uh-huh. it has to be done. If you don't declare it, they're going to say lose. those rights don't exist. Yeah, yeah. If you don't use it, you lose it. Anyway, it's been great talking to y'all. Well, gee, thanks a lot, Joey. We really appreciate your time. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, and, and let's stay in touch. This is wonderful. Okay. Got your number. Got right. information. <laughs> okay.